D. Watkins here with Salon TV, and today I'll be joined by director of Studio 54, Matt Turner. How are you doing today? Good, how are you? I'm great. I really, really, really enjoyed your film. Thank um, you. Watched it last night, watched it again on the train coming to pay this morning. I thought it was um, I thought it was amazing. It had any and everything a good film should have, from just beautiful visuals and then put everything in historical context. I just I thought it was great. What what drew you to this to this project? Well, I think this is a story that everyone thinks they know, but they don't really know. Uh, Studio 54 is 40 years ago, uh, but it's still uh, world famous and uh, a hot topic for a lot of people. Uh, however, the real story never had been told because uh, the surviving co-founder of the show, Ian Schrager, mm -hmm. uh, never really talked before. Um, he was ashamed of Studio 54, which gets to another reason why it's a good story to tell, uh, in that it was the fastest rise probably anyone ever had in New York. The success was overnight, but the fall was very hard. He was so young, and you know, both of these guys they experienced success, and you know, quick. Uh, you know, you would think looking back that um, he wouldn't be ashamed of that, but well, it was. Uh, you allude to the other partner, uh, Steve Rubell. Steve Rubell, yeah. Yeah, who was a little older than Ian. Ian was in his 20s at the time. And uh, they um, were an incredible partnership uh, who really shouldn't have been successful. It was the perfect time for two guys from the outer boroughs to kind of get a foothold in Manhattan and um, ride the kind of meteor of studio to uh, the type of overnight success they had. So there's like some, some young people out there watching. Um, just to put it in context for them, what is Studio 54? Studio 54 is the greatest nightclub of all time. Uh, it was uh, 1977 to 1980, 33 months that kind of were the uh, capstone of the what we can now call the disco era, right. uh, when disco was king. And um, it brought nightlife to a new level, and it dominated the culture in New York City for those 33 months. Do you think there's anything um, we can compare it to today? Well, I think the comparisons are more congruent, actually. Things like Burning Man, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. like very over-the-top spectacles, I think are like studio. They have the kind of allure, mystery, and air of um, wrongness that's very right about them. Right. And I think the studio was one of the first places to have that that wasn't uh, a house of ill repute. Yeah, yeah it's like um, you always hear the stories about the celebrities and, and the drug use and, you know, like the lights and there was nothing like it during this time. It really was kind of the, uh, the iPhone of nightclubs yeah. in a way. Uh, there were discos before studio and mm -hmm. there were discos after, but it really took the concept and pushed it to next level. Uh, lights are a good example. Uh, and it's interesting because they were upstarts in the nightclub business, uh, no one would work with them. So the right. traditional uh, lighting designers just said, I'm not going to work with you. So they went to Broadway and got Broadway lighting designers, and that upped the game. So what do you think was so different um, you know, that made them catch fire like that? Uh, I think it was that kind of they built a better mousetrap. They opened the club in a theater, which was unusual. Mm -hmm. So they used a kind of theatrical space. The balcony became like a voyeuristic overhang on the dance floor. The dance floor was where the stage was. And then they used the theatrical flies to drop props down. And um, that created a kind of immersive experience. Then they also had an incredible PR game where they mm -hmm. got the most famous people of the day to uh, come in and uh, frequent the club. And it became really the hot spot without any uh, competition. Uh, there were there were also rands, but there was nothing like studio. Yeah, there's like, it seemed like um, everyone wanted to be there because of the celebrities. But why do you think the celebrities wanted to be there? Why did it become a popular you know, spot amongst? I think they, they made it into a, a really glamorous space that was a safe place for everyone to be. It was very hard to get into. So uh, Andy Warhol used to say it was a democracy at the door, but right. a democracy <laughs> inside. Or sorry, it was, a, it was a dictatorship at the right. door and a democracy on the inside. That's the quote. And uh, I think 
they vetted the crowd so thoroughly that uh, everyone felt comfortable. So part of the charm of it was that if you were a very famous person, and many of them went there, like Diana Ross, for instance, or Michael Jackson, or uh, Liza Minnelli, uh, sports heroes of the day, mm -hmm. like Reggie Jackson, that if the people who were in there went up to sit next to you because you knew they were kind of hand-selected, it, it had a kind of coolness to it that wasn't threatening to anybody. Do you feel like um, that coolness like ever backfired in any way? Like I know that the initial person who had complaints about the club was someone who felt like they wasn't being treated there. So, but I'm, but it seems like that was more of an insider. Do you think it had any like anything any negative impact on a person who felt like I got money, I'm cool. And my shirt is nice. How come I can't get in? Yeah, I think it did. I think that that's part of one of the forgotten things about it is that uh, the door being that strict was kind of a new thing at that time. Mm -hmm. The velvet rope was kind of invented at Studio 54. They let in who they wanted to let in, and it didn't have anything to do with money, uh, which is a good thing, I think, in a way, but it was elitist in, its, in another way. So. Uh, they created something special. Uh, they worked with the kind of um, scarcity theory mm -hmm. that uh, if something was hard to get into would be desirable. And uh, that, that game worked. However, I think it came back to bite them because a lot mm -hmm. of people were very pissed off that they couldn't get in. Yeah, you, were like, you were too young to hang out at a club like that, but mm -hmm. did you hear about it from like older people in your family? Or? Uh, well, I grew up in L.A. I, I, everyone heard about it. I was, in, I think, in the second grade. Yeah. I, I knew about it, I think. Everyone knew about it. Right. Everyone knew about disco, too. Um, and everyone knew about Disco Sucks, uh, yeah. which was... So, you know, not, you know we're not, like I said, we're not going to do any, you know, we're not going to give away any major parts of the film, but Disco Sucks is like, right. it's kind of sad. Disco Sucks was sad. I remember, like, I was in, uh, I don't know, like, first grade, second grade, and people were writing Disco Sucks on their notebooks, and I... <laughs> I, I don't think I wrote it, but I, I knew what it meant, but I knew yeah, that thought, what it, I knew it. there was something called Disco Sucks. <laughs> Um, I had older brother, stepbrothers who um, thought disco sucked. Uh, but disco sucks uh, was the anti-disco movement, which is a mm -hmm. kind of complicated confluence of social movements that were negative, in my opinion. Right. Uh, disco was an African-American uh, dance form, music form, that merged with a gay dance culture. So in mm -hmm. New York City, in other cities, there was this kind of like amazing cultural blending happening. And it was at first underground. Um, and then it kind of like came to the surface. And uh, it was the rage in all the cities. Then it became a very popular music form. But because of the racial blending and the kind of um, permissiveness of drugs and sex around the world of discos at that time, when the imagery got out there of, you know, like black people dancing with white people, this was right. sort of somehow shocking. Right. Uh, and, uh, How'd that happen? Exactly. <laughs> so I think it like freaked out a lot of culturally conservative people and politicians right. used it to um, kind of demagogue and uh, the whole disco era came crashing down. And Studio 54 was in a way the, um, the kind of canary in the coal mine for that. Studio crashed and mm -hmm. disco, the whole thing crashed after that. Yeah, it's crazy because even like, um, so I was born in the 80s, and if you were born in the 80s, you grew up under strictly hip hop culture. So like, when I would see like pictures of my uncles and some of these guys are gangsters and they have like these lace shirts on and these sparkly pants, I'm like, what is this about? And they're like, oh, this is a long time ago, you don't understand, but like, you're not that much older than right. the rest yeah. of us. So, yeah. I mean, do you feel like the disco era gets enough credit in like its influence on contemporary culture or? Well, I think uh, in this, uh, this is part of the magic of Studio 54. I think Studio 54 gets a lot of credit. So mm -hmm. designers are always doing Studio 54 influence collections. And the influence of Studio is acknowledged in the culture for sure. I don't think people want to talk about disco, though, because I think yeah. it still has kind of like a bad odor to it for some reason. Are we going to leave it dead? Or? Well, I don't think it is dead. I think that's right. the thing. I think that people don't talk about it, but I think it kind of was reborn um, in... Uh, there are elements of it in hip hop, there are elements mm -hmm. of it in EDM. Like it, it just sort of morphed a little bit and got different labels. 
Yeah, one of the cool things I see um, that I saw in the film is the club was able to cut right through homophobia and transphobia mm -hmm. and right. create a place where everybody can mix and mingle. Right. Did you think that was like a plan or do you think it just developed organically through the vibe that was going on? I think it was partly the vibe. I, Steve Rubell, who kind of like ran the door um, and was a great people person, probably the greatest people person of all time, uh, he under, seems hilarious in the film. Yeah, well, he was like he couldn't have gotten into studio. He was kind of mm -hmm. like a, a loser from Brooklyn who managed to become the biggest winner of all. It, right. it, that's an interesting story in its own right, and that's a big part of the story of studio. But um, he was a kind of a visionary in um, cultural blending. He had no hang-ups about anybody that was um, kind of like participating in dance culture and nightlife culture. Nightlife culture was very niche uh, at the time. Only a few thousand people probably went out at night and they all knew each other more or less. Mm -hmm. And there was racial mixing and cultural mixing and blending and that was part of it. Uh, drag queens were kind of new on the scene and they were welcome to the disco. So the disco as an area of, uh, of a zone of acceptance is a really important part of the story and I think a very beautiful part of the story that's probably under told. And Rebel basically was like the main one that like was in control of the list. Yeah, well there, were t there was a list and they even called people every day to right. say please come down and you're welcome. These were very special people they were calling but they were kind of like the hand-picked movers and shakers in the city, but they were different than the ones from the previous generation who were more like high roller types or bankers and things like that. They weren't so interested in those people. They were interested in fashion designers and singers and stars and sport and athletes and things like that. And also going across racial lines and... Um, do you think it was a pretty diverse mix? As far uh, as like inside, racially? considering it was filtered, mm -hmm. it was pretty diverse. That was part of the whole game, which was, that's, that's to their credit. You could attack them all you want for being elitist, though, and mm -hmm. they were elitist, right. but there was, it was kind of like a star chamber of diversity. So if you have to channel your inner rebel and make like a checklist for who you're going to let in the club, right. what would be on there? Well, for, it would be different now than then probably. I guess then it would be, you know, you want the pretty boys, the pretty girls, the people that are going to dance. Everyone knew who those people were because right. the disco dance floor was a relatively new thing at that time. Like people weren't doing that until probably the mid 70s, early 70s into the mid 70s it became, it was underground in the middle mm -hmm. of the 70s. Then there were the kind of Liza Minnelli types, then there were the Vetus Gerolitis, who was a big tennis champion right. at the time, right. he was there. Uh, then there was Grace Jones and uh, Sterling St. Jacques, uh, who were amazing performers and dancers. And then people like uh, Rolla Rina, who was a cross-dressing Wall Street worker who uh, had a nighttime persona as a fairy godmother yeah, and, that was, no, on that roller was, skates. Yeah, no, that was great. That yeah. was great. Do you think um, they went and they let, they let Trump in, a young Trump? Yeah, so the story is that Nikki Haskell, who was kind of like a, I don't know what, a woman around town at the time, mm -hmm. um, brought Trump and Ivana on opening night, apparently no one except Nikki saw him. Right, <laughs> I think they left right, early. Right. Uh, but yeah, he. I mean, anyone who was on the scene could get in once or twice. But probably. Trump today wouldn't get in. They knew what he would grow up to be, maybe he wouldn't get. <laughs> I think it's possible that he wouldn't. Someone asked me earlier whether Kim Kardashian would get in, and yeah. I, uh, my thought is that probably at first they would have resisted her. Right. But that's the cool thing, or like what made it interesting is that like even when like with the Rolling Stones, like some like Mick Jagger can walk in, but another person might have to pay. Yeah, well, the uh, person who ran the list at the door said that uh, Keith Richards and Mick Jagger were allowed in free, but the mm. rest of the Stones had to pay. <laughs> That's how arrogant they were. I mean, they were really kind of drunk on their success. There's so no question the about big, it. The big part, um, the big part of the, like, the initial downfall was just the popularity, but it's like you can't hide a club like that, so you can't, there's no way to go back and, and readjust some of the ways they moved. Unless we're talking about the business side, or what do you think? What do you think? Uh, I think they were a victim of their own success. They broke a lot of rules. They pissed a lot of people off. Um, they pissed off the people who were powerful in New York, frankly, uh, who were some politicians. Other politicians, they they kissed the butt of. Uh, their lawyer was Roy Cohn, who was mm -hmm. the number one fixer of the day, who also happened to be the. Uh, 
attorney for the uh, dons of the five mafia families. So they had, um, in a certain sense, uh, they thought New York wrapped around their f little finger, but uh, I think they miscalculated. The first time they were raided, it was by the chairman of the state liquor authority because they neglected to get a little thing called a liquor license when they opened the nightclub. If you think about that with hindsight, that's the most absurd thing in the world. How right. can you have a nightclub without a liquor license? Yeah, but they did. They had, like catering liquor licenses right. every month for like half the time they were open or something like that. Yeah, they got a nightly catering license. <laughs> I mean, this would never happen today. They would be arrested mm -hmm. immediately. Uh, New York was a different town then. It was a, a town of rule breakers and um, fixers who um, patched over the broken rules. It was, in a way, a much more fun city, I think, at the moment because uh, it was a bit anarchic. Uh, <clears throat> it was kind of like cities like Berlin, mm -hmm. where the bottom's fallen out, but there's still a creative culture there that's taking advantage of, of the uh, infrastructure of the old order. Studio was uh, not an establishment thing at first. It was right. actually a bit rebellious, and the establishment embraced it, and it just skyrocketed into a stratosphere that no one had known before. But they were hustlers, and I think this. I think it's something that yeah. um, something that we definitely celebrate in this country, and something that I think um, people can appreciate their ability to be able to take this situation and make something brilliant. So. Um, and then, you know, the flip side of that is you see it crash and burn and, and some of the things that happened to them as a result of the way they ran the club. Right. I feel like a lot of um, young entrepreneurs are going to watch this film and mm. they might, you know, you know, get some, be inspired by just the energy. What do you think are some of the main things they should take away? That's a good point. I think that this was kind of like the garage phase of the disco. And, you know, mm -hmm. they said computers were born in a garage. So this yeah. was that. Uh, this was that environment. Uh, well, I think the um, crazy ambition and shooting mm -hmm. for the moon, I think, is part of it. Um, hard work, and also in the sense, uh, I think the biggest component of it was partnership. Uh, these two guys, Steve Rubelny and Traeger, had very different skill sets. Mm -hmm. They weren't jealous of each other's skills and they came together to form a perfect whole. Schrager was Mr. Inside, who was diligent, organized, um, very good businessman, very shrewd, good negotiator. Mm -hmm. Rubel was Mr. Outside, he was a people person, and uh, Schrager was um, very shy, almost pathologically shy, so he didn't want to be talking to people. Right. That's why it took 40 years. Right, <laughs> to exactly. Tell the story. But exactly. Lucky, lucky you were in the right place at the right time to be able to tell that story. And I think, I think you did it really well. Thank you so much. Why don't you tell everyone where they can see the film? Studio 54, uh, the film, opens uh, this Friday, tomorrow, at, in New York City at the IFC Center. And then uh, the following weekend uh, in LA and also will continue in New York and selected cities and then all through October and November and the fall into the winter will be available in movie theaters in your city so uh, check the Google uh, and uh, our website studio54doc.com uh, uh, and uh, you'll be able to find us. It's a great film you guys should go see it. Thank you. Thank you.